This is Nan McKay, and I would like to introduce you today to Inez Ribostello. Do you sometimes wish you knew what wine to buy and serve? Well, Inez Ribostello's passion and expertise covers three areas, wine, beer, and food. Inez placed second runner, runner up in the best sommelier in America competition held in New York City. And she's a member of the Alumni Hall of Fame for the Institute of Culinary Education and a graduate of the Court of Master Sommelier's Advanced Exam. In addition to all that and those credentials, she was beverage director for the renowned World Trade Center restaurant, Windows on the World, putting her in the position of wine buyer for the largest grossing restaurant in North America. And she was there when the World Trade Center was bombed. Let's meet the woman with this fascinating experience. So welcome, Inez. Thank you, Nan. I'm very excited to be here. What an exciting career. Let's talk about all of it. <laughs> so out of college with a degree in journalism and mass communications, I, I might have thought that you'd have pursued a career maybe at a magazine or a news channel, but instead, your dream was to pursue a career in cooking. In fact, you chose New York's Institute of Culinary Education to get started. So tell me, why did you segue into wine? Well, I was in culinary school and I um, would take the subway up to 92nd. Well, my, my school was 92nd and 2nd, but the subway stop was 86th in Lexington. And there was this beautiful, sleek, um, ex, you know, very um, modern wine store right on the corner of 86 in Lexington. And so I would go into the store every afternoon after school. And for, uh, I think it only took the assistant manager a week before she came up to me and offered me a part-time job as a wine associate at Best Sellers and Sellers was spelled C-E-L-L-A-R-S. So for the next six months while I was in culinary school, every Monday through Friday, as soon as I would leave, I would run to work, change clothes and work until about 10 or 10.30 in the evening selling wine. And by the time I had completed culinary school, I realized I liked to drink more than I liked to cook. <laughs> but but no one you know I grew up in the rural eastern North Carolina and firstly no one had told me there was the word culinary you know I had found that out uh doing an internship in DC in journalism but this wine world that was really really uh different and seemed you know exotic um, so I had read an article in the New York times about a woman named Andrea Emmer, whose name is now in Andrea Emmer Robinson. And she was the beverage director at windows on the world. And so I cold called her and, um, she said, don't quit your day job, but fax me your resume. And it took about six months, but she finally called me one, um, afternoon in February and said they were opening up a new restaurant on the 107th floor where Cellar in the Sky used to be. And that was the smaller, more, more intimate restaurant. And this new one was going to be called Wild Blue. And it was a steakhouse and it was going to have a large wine by the glass program. And she said, would you like to interview for the hostess position? And I thought to myself, oh no that's not what I want to do <laughs> but my dad said go up there and interview show them how great you can be at something you don't want to do that you're not passionate about and they'll be very very um you know they'll believe that you could be amazing at something that you do love or do want to do and so the day I went up for the interview it was a cold Friday in February and when I got to the site there were five people from the beverage department there to interview me, which I thought that was unusual because 
I didn't expect that many people for a hostess position, but an assistant cellar master had resigned that morning. And so they said, you know, if you're interested, would you like to interview for this position instead? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> that just shows you, doesn't it? That, you know, if you had passed that by, if you'd have said, oh, a hostess position is beneath me or not really living up to my education and I'm not going to do it. You wouldn't have had the chance. The possibility of not having the chance was huge, but you just got in there and did it. That's great. Right. I think there's a lot of truth to being in the right place at the right time, but there's also a lot of truth in you have to make your own destiny in some situations. And I was committed to getting into that wine department and I thought it would be more difficult. I thought I was going to have to take the host position and then really, you know, persuade them later on, but it just so happened that, um, the, you know, it was easier. <laughs> easier you know I've been sitting here thinking uh which do I like better cooking slash eating or drinking and I don't know I think it's about 50 50 <laughs> <laughs> they, they go very well together <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead tell us about your career at this uh, restaurant that you were in where you really got started and then how did that segue into windows of the world well, so the assistant seller master position was for the entire company. So immediately I became an employee of Windows on the World. Um, and I, uh, an assistant seller master is a, a very fancy word for minimum wage paid box mover. But I moved boxes, wine boxes, liquor boxes, beer boxes from the basement of the World Trade Center where the bulk of our inventory was to the 106 store where we had a little larger cellar to the actually working wine cellar, which was on the 107th floor where the captains and the waiters and the servers from all three or now four outlets. So there were four revenue streams for windows on the world. There was obviously the restaurant, which was massive. Then there was the smaller little steakhouse called wild blue. And then there was the greatest bar on earth which was the fun, really, you know, DJs, bands, uh, um, you know, less, less upscale than Windows or Wild Blue, but still a lot of, you know, people in the dot-com, which was the boom of that time, and the um, investment bankers came to just sip martinis and, you know, cognac and, and drink great wine in a, in a little um, bit more casual setting. And then, of course, the I don't know if it was the biggest uh, revenue generator, but but one of the top was the banquets. And so tons of banquets all the time. You know, people had weddings there. They had bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, um, you know, holiday parties. Uh, it was just a, a big deal. And so I, the assistant cellar masters were in charge of wine for all four of those areas. Wine, well, all beverages, actually. Wow. Uh, you know, I bet you have a lot of stories about that time. Well, I think back and kind of tell me what was one of the most memorable events at that location? Well, for me, you know, Nan, I really fell hook, line, and sinker in with wine, uh, in love with wine, and that incredible family of, of people who worked at Windows. And one thing that I had started in culinary school was reading the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal wine articles that came out once a week. And for the Wall Street Journal, it was a husband and wife team, um, John Brechter and Dorothy Gator, and they um, would come in to dinner. And it was like, for me, serving the Queen and King of England, I just thought, they were, um, firstly, you know, I still had the journalism love of writing and, and they were writers and they were writing about wine and they were lovely, fun and um, interesting people. And so when they would come up and um, dine and, and they had two little girls who sometimes they would bring with them, getting to serve them wine was, it was magical. And, you know, after 9-11, they, they wrote an article about, you know, 
the end of an era really with with the loss of that restaurant and I've just admired them since you know 1998 when I got to New York and and continue to do so this day. There were a lot of highlights for for people like the SAG awards were held at the top of the World Trade Center in the in one of the banquet rooms and so Bill Murray would come and and drink and you know of course um, a lot of the Yankees players would come and dine and Susan Sarandon and Tim Robbins and you know I was very excited about that but really my 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 fondest uh, memories are of Dorothy and John. Let's think back to those horrible terrorist attacks. How did they impact you? And, and I guess both personally and professionally. Yeah, um, personally, you know, I lost, um, I lost a family um, who I loved dearly and not just people who were up there who were killed, but also people who lived that I just never saw again. Um, and I lost what I believed at the time was the best job I would ever have. And then I lost the person I had been before 9-11. You know, I'm a very different person. I was a very different person the moment those towers started imploding. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I mourn, I mourn that person as much as I mourn anything because there was a death of um, innocence and optimism and hope that um, I'll never get back. Um, professionally, it shaped me in many ways. Firstly, you know, working in restaurants is intense, high energy. There's a lot of, um, we have to make sure everything's perfect. And my outlook on that changed completely. You know, the worst thing that can happen in a restaurant is not that we get someone's orders wrong or that we spill hot coffee on them or that we, you know, have a diner send a zero star review. You know, what the worst thing that can happen is, is what happened on 9 11. And so my perspective changed greatly. Um, I also believe that how I operate um, spaces was shaped because of the family-like community that worked at Windows on the World and the many different people who I worked with from many different countries of many different religious backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, you know, I thought that was, um, I will say it to this day, you know, the, the windows on the world family was what I imagined heaven to look like, mm -hmm. you know, all of us. And, and so, um, you know, things change I, I, there, even to this day, I will think of things that maybe I will do differently because of, you know, because of losing my job in that way um, on 9-11. I'm sure everybody, practically everybody remembers where they were when those planes hit the tower. Mm -hmm. And you must have not been there, of course, because that was up so high, the restaurant. And I'm assuming it's because it was earlier in the day. Is Can you remember, tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, so no, I, I was a eight to fiver because I didn't work the floor. I, I worked, you know, managed all the inventory, but my sister got married on September 8th and I had flown home to be the maid of honor in her wedding. And so my husband, who um, is now my husband, he was my boyfriend at the time, he was the sommelier in the dining room. He was due in at noon. Mm -hmm. um, but I was out of town. My flight was scheduled to fly home on the morning of September 12th, which obviously it was canceled. All flights were canceled for a week, a whole week after. And you, your first call was probably to your boyfriend at the time saying you didn't go in early. Did you? Yeah. I called him multiple times and he had been at the, he had watched the giants play 
um, the night before and was still asleep. So he wasn't answering. I was calling my office where the two men who were working for me and it was busy signals. And the first person I got in touch with in the city was um, my old coworker who was living on the Upper West Side and, and she was crying. And that's when I, I was so confused. Why is she crying? You know, I just didn't understand until those towers started coming down that, you know, what was really happening it was in a state of shock. The magnitude of it. Yeah. Tell us about your next job then. You had to make a change, obviously, because the restaurant wasn't there anymore. So tell us about your next job at the Blue Fin. We were determined to go back into the city and live and be a part of the build back and the build up. Knowing what I know now, you know, what I needed to invest in was intense therapy, <laughs> but that wasn't really in my toolbox. You know, I didn't know about that. Um, and I also should have taken a job that was not in management. I had no, no, um, I had no business managing other people or being in a management position, but I was convinced that I needed to go back and do exactly what I had done at Windows and was hired at, um, the restaurant group was called Be Our Guest and they had opened multiple restaurants in the city and this was their first one in a hotel. And uh, it was in the W Times Square Hotel, it was called Bluefin. We opened on New Year's Eve, 2001 in Times Square, which was insane. And um, I was hired as the wine director where I, I got to create my first list, you know, with windows when I, when I moved up the ranks, I inherited a list that I got to, you know, modify at times, whether, you know, adding or deleting items. But this was the first time I got to create an, a wine list. I created their wine by the glass list. I created their cocktail list and um, worked there until March of 02. And then just told my, my, my boyfriend, I can't do it. I can't do it. And, um, we had already planned to go work the harvest in France in 2000, in fall 2002. My parents were begging me to come home. And Stephen said, you know, we have this gift that your mom and dad will let us move to Tarboro and take some time off and live with them. You know, why not? And I had said, I will never go home again. And, and here I am going home. So, and a door closes and a door opens. Yep. I, you know, someone called my house and um, I answered and she said, I'm trying to sell this restaurant. And I hear that your, your fiance and you are restaurateurs. I'm sure she didn't even say restaurateurs actually, I, I, you know. Um, and I said, we don't have two dimes to rub together. So thanks, but no thanks. And my dad overheard the conversation he went to look at the restaurant the next day, which was a like a breakfast lunch. All the food was cooked on a panini press in, in the in the dining room. Had a smoking section. <laughs> it was you know, and um, he partnered with a doctor in town, and they um, said we're going to close on this restaurant. And I thought, no way, absolutely no way. We do not want to do this. And my husband, my fiance, we hadn't even gotten married yet. He said, look, I don't think anything's going to survive here. This is a culinary wasteland, but I'll give you an 18 month commitment. And um, we closed on the restaurant the day we came back from working harvest in France. And we just turned 19 years old. Wow. <laughs> so how in the world then did you get into beer brewing? Brewing. I say that right. uh, it's 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 wild actually you know I've my husband and I've always loved to drink beer um but we knew nothing about brewing it and in um 2007 we had been told from a lot of customers that we'd outgrown the space that you know there weren't enough seats and and it was hard to get in and we should go to a bigger space and so we bought a 10,000 square foot building down the street from the restaurant to move 
slowly move that over to. Well, I think we closed on that building in summer of 2008. And then in the fall, the whole economy tanked. The bottom fell out. You know, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. And nobody wanted to invest in a restaurant, period, much less one in Eastern North Carolina. So we're paying a mortgage on this, while charming and big building, it was also complete disrepair. I mean, and so um, we were watching what a couple of new breweries in Eastern North Carolina were doing for small towns. And um, we had a friend who had lived in Tarboro his whole life, moved up to Philadelphia to go to um, boarding school and stayed and become the director of quality assurance at a huge brewery in Philadelphia. And so he came home for Christmas and I said, look, let's do this. We can't do it without you. But how cool would this be to have a brewery in downtown Tarboro? And the other thing, Nan, I think it's important to mention, my children were starting school at this time. And I was noticing that a lot of the families that my kids were going to school with didn't come into the restaurant. Um, while we're very affordable for Chicago, LA, San Francisco, we're in a, we're in a poor rural community and um, a lot of unemployment. And, and that's just the reality. And the other reality was I wanted to transition out of the restaurant business and be in something that was more around my kids' schedule as well, um, which hasn't been exactly what's happened. But um, Franklin's response when we said, we can't do this brewery without you, why don't, why don't we do it? He said, yeah, you raise the money. If you raise the money, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. And so this is 2012, we write this business plan. You know, again, I hadn't written a business plan. We, my dad bought this restaurant with a partner. We just started doing our thing and it became successful with no like planning preparation, just us doing what we did because we loved it. And what I found was I was beginning not to love it, <laughs> um, which is a whole nother story, but so we write this business plan. We start raising money. We did an Indiegogo campaign. We finally got the doors open in 2016. So eight years after we purchased the building, four years after we wrote the business plan, three years after we started raising money. And also the number of breweries in North Carolina had tripled at this point by the time we got the doors open. It, it, it's been the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, and I predominantly do sales. I, I've brewed a couple of times with Franklin, but Franklin is our brewer and he brews excellent beer, which makes it easier for me to sell when we're selling great beer. But the bottom line is I went from a job where people were calling me, texting me, emailing me about a reservation, a hard to get reservation to where people cross the street so they don't have to talk to me about buying a case of beer or a six of beer to put on tap. So, you know, there are sacrifices and there are opportunities in everything. And while I um, have sacrificed being wildly popular, <laughs> I have also um, grown into a, a position I didn't know that I actually had in me. And I thought it was going to be super easy to sell beer. Um, it's actually easier to sell wine, I think. <laughs> well, you now have a new book. Tell I us do. a little bit about that. So it's been 20 plus years in the making. I have um, been in love with this book and um, yet very intimidated by this book for the past 20 years. And and second guessing myself on putting it out there into the universe. And I think part of it was it wasn't completed, um, but I had a goal to have it released on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And so I finished it this summer and um, self-published and got it out 
um, on September 11th. And it's been one of the most gratifying and magical experiences to ever happen to me. Well, we will definitely put it on our website, uh, on your guest page, so everybody can purchase it right from there. And it's a, such a great story and so inspiring to say, you know, you slog away, you go down, you go up, you have, you have to pivot over and over again. And that's what you did. So thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you for everything that you've done. And I just so admire the way that you just get back up, <laughs> put your head down and yes, keep swinging. Thank you. Thank you, man. I'm, I'm really grateful to have this platform to, to talk about it.